Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, can you hear me great. all right? Yes, I can hear you all right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I'll, uh, my pleasure. I'll, well, I can leap straight into it so as not to take too much of your time, but you had the you had from me the explanation about who we are and what the party is. And so the context in which this was shown is, is of course at our party conference. And it's ahead of a debate around whether data-driven technology can help create equality or is part of the problem or both things. So um, that's, that's, the, that's the context. Um, and we'll just get a, a, a segment of this conversation for broadcast and we'll show you what it is obviously before we do. So okay, this sounds great. Start? So um, I'll uh, have the entire recording, right? We're already recording. Yes. Uh, and yes. uh, I'm free to publish it afterwards, after you had your um, exactly. display. Um, and so time-wise, I have two hours, so we can talk about pretty much anything. Um, okay. Right. Well, we're, we're certainly, we're intending to have a, a much shorter excerpt, but I'm happy to sure. talk to you for longer because mm -hmm. there's a lot I think mm -hmm. I can learn from you. So, um, mm -hmm. well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll begin as, as for this segment now. Minister, thank you very much for finding the time to talk to us today. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you because there are very few politicians who I would say are engaged in transformative politics. And there are fewer still who are finding finding ways to harness technology to that transformation. I wanted to talk to you in the beginning about the Sunflower Movement. There wasn't as much publicity around that uh, in the UK as you might have imagined. So would you mind starting by uh, explaining the Sunflower Movement and your involvement in it? Because it, it was really something quite amazing. Certainly. Um, the Sunflower Movement uh, was a Occupy movement uh, for 22 days in March to April 2014. And during those 22 days, students and activists occupied the parliament. And they did this for demonstration, but not demonstration in a protesting sense, but rather demonstration in a demo kind of sense. And the reason of the occupation was that the MPs at the time were refusing to deliberate a trade service agreement with Beijing uh, for constituents. Uh, and so because of that, the uh, students did the deliberation for the MPs because they kind of went on strike. So they occupied the parliament and did the deliberation with the people. Um, at the height of the Occupy, there's about half a million of people on the street and even more people online watching the live stream, the uh, real-time transcripts, the uh, various discussion boards, and all the different products of this uh, massive Occupy movement. And uh, two things um, is distinguished this Occupy movement from other Occupy movements around the world. The first one I think is very important is that during the 22 days, uh, mostly nonviolent, Every day, um, people converge a little bit more on what they think about the trade service agreement. And this means that more than 20 uh, NGOs concerning labor, concerning uh, equality of the genders, concerning, uh, for example, environmental protection and so on, each had their own kind of corner. Uh, around the occupied place, but they were all linked with a kind of nervous system that channels all the consensus made, all the points made, all the people's feelings into a shared document that is shared by all the more than 20 NGOs in the Occupy. And the um, end result is that like cross-pollinating 
uh, ideas. People would just go from one NGO's booth to another over the course of a day. Maybe they would visit five different corners. And at the end of the day, people did a recap, a synthetic document. So by the beginning of the next day, people just talk about the things that they did not yet have consensus. Mm -hmm. And so that's the first distinguishing factor in that it converges rather than diverges. And the second uh, so, factor, so, I think, so, is equally. So, yes. Sorry. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but so in Taiwan, no, there had been there had been a, a dearth of democracy. Um, you had a government that was not listening to the people, and instead, what you got through the Occupy movement was not only people coming in to have them to make their views heard, but you found a way of having a discussion that created greater understanding around the issue and greater consensus around the issue. So you moved away from that, that's polarized exactly right. politics. And was that that's using, exactly was right. that already, mm -hmm. and this is already using technology for this as well as live debate. That's right. So the second distinguishing factor is that we allowed people who participate in any corner in the street to view a real time live streaming of what's happening inside the occupied parliament. And there's also a live chat channel where people just type in what exactly they were hearing from the 20 or more um, debate stations um, so that people can just at a glance see what the topics are being debated as well as getting the consensus that's being made from this debate on the street. And so this is a ICT technology, but it is for enabling people to listen to hundreds of thousands of people rather than speaking to hundreds of thousands of people. We often see social media or even television and radio used in a broadcasting manner. That is to say, it enables people to uh, obey or follow the party line or to somehow you know, get a talking points from one or two people uh, with power. But this is the inverse of that. This technology enables um, tens of thousands of people to listen to one another and it enabled the people who did it occupy in the occupied parliament to kind of listen to those people and get them their voice as a single voice so this is a deployment of what we call assistive civic technology that let people as points being heard in a way that is accountable so it's moving away from echo chambers and and towards uh, a way of a way of facilitating debate and a way of creating information, which um, you know, sitting here in in England, where we're now living with the results of a referendum, which in some way looks like people power, but of course was based on only partial and very polarized information, is a very very interesting. Uh, piece of history and and with an incredibly interesting outcome. So so what happened? happened after all of these debates? So afterwards, I think at the 21st day or so, um, the general occupiers as well as participants converged on a set of recommendations um, toward the trade service agreement. And um, the head of the parliament, the head of the MPs, accepted uh, every single one of them. And so the Occupy was a victory. So the idea, very simply put, is that people want the treatment uh, with Beijing to be treated as any other foreign uh, treaty to be deliberated by the MPs in exactly the same way. And they also called for a national forum on uh, making a um, real-time responsive um, deliberation system modeled after the ICT system deployed during the Occupy so that people can look at any part of the budget, look at any part of regulation and do e-petitions and so on so that they don't have to occupy again uh, if some other controversial topic comes up. And so during the national forum, it was uh, decided that we did a national e-participation platform called the JOIN platform. And of the 23 million people in Taiwan, about 5 million at the moment is used in the joint platform. Five million, five million people using it on, on, a, on a, a basis that helps form... Yeah, on an active basis, that, that, that's right. So about one quarter of people who can use internet. Of course, that number can still grow, but still, I think we're performing much better uh, than other countries. 
And what was your role in this? Um, and you, you, mm. you, came, you came into this as somebody with Silicon Valley experience, which is also mm. fairly unusual politician. Mm. Yeah, um, so at the time of the Occupy, I was a uh, independent consultant uh, to a company called Social Text, which is called a wiki company. Uh, we make wikis, we make microblogging, we make a lot of so-called social media tools, but for Fortune 500 um, companies, as well as large uh, nonprofits, in order to enhance their uh, internal communication and make sure that the knowledge is captured within the organization rather than inside specific silos. And so make, basically we do something that's like um, Facebook plus Twitter plus Wikipedia, but with the aim of of getting people's things done in the flow of work rather than just keeping them on the website and watching as many advertisements as possible. So it's the same set of technology, social technology, but with a very different goal uh, in mind because it is deployed to people's uh, you know, business hours rather than off hours. So um, that's my background. I've been working with social text uh, since 2008, so quite a long time. And at the same time, I'm also a consultant and independent uh, contractor uh, in Apple's Siri team. So I'm also working on machine learning, on cross-language understanding, on semantic understanding, and things like that. So I bring my contribution um, to the Occupy mostly by setting up the communication network and making sure that uh, facts spread faster than rumors. Now, this is easier said than done um, because yeah. rumors have a way to provoke outrage and outrage makes people share messages even before they fact check them, right? Uh, and so the only way we discover that makes facts spread faster than rumors is to make facts fun is to make facts something that's interactive, something that you can just type in your company registration number or your trade you're doing, and you see a very interactive graphics um, that shows exactly how the trade service agreement affects you. And so, of course, all these are done by a wider civic tech community, and my main role is just to maintain kind of the portal, the information portal of the Occupy movement and making sure that uh, all the different endeavors that makes it uh, possible to have informed discussion is aware of each other's existence as well as maintaining um, the um, back-end infrastructure against the cybersecurity attacks and things like that. I don't know of any other part of the Occupy movement that's actually ended up in government anywhere in the world. Um, so you, hmm. you, actually, you actually went from this, this uprising, this popular, popular uprising, to actually being in government and putting these things into practice from the top down, even though what you're talking about is something with much more participation and, and civic engagement. Yeah, it is somewhat comparable with the 15M uh, movement in Spain. Uh, where many occupiers at, at the time uh, was also becoming um, like um, Madrid mayors and also people in various important cities. But you, you are now digital minister. So as I say, you're yeah. bringing, you're bringing all mm -hmm. of this to bear as, as not just something that is part of um, a protest, but something that is everyday politics. And that, that's, that's right, because we see our dev demonstration as a demo, right? <laughs> so now I'm deploying yeah. demo into production uh, as we talk about this, yes. <laughs> Um, when you were in Silicon Valley, uh, you also saw at close hand um, some of the difficulties with that culture. You know, one of the things that people worry about technology is that it's being made by a small and not very diverse group of people with certain ideas about what it can do. Um, do you? Do you worry about this as well, and do you do you think that technology can be the answer to the work to the concerns around technology? Yeah, it is a, a concern uh, because at the beginning, when we're doing the mobile version of the social text, what we call signals, which is very much like Twitter, um, <clears throat> we didn't anticipate that it kind of has a um, effect on the habit of people like back in 2010 or so. Um, it's like if 
a person only installs one messaging system on their phones, it actually increases their productivity. But if a person installs three or four uh, instant message systems, uh, it's like a cocktail um, effect on the mind because the mind would be constantly context switching. And it actually, from a mental health perspective, puts people in a always um, adrenaline rush or uh, a fear of missing out state um, that is not conductive to the kind of deep listening or deliberation uh, that we were just talking about. So we uh, we were part of the problem, I guess. <laughs> um, but we're, I think, also um, aware that it is possible to have technologies um, that reduce the uh, demand on attention and indeed uh, the inherent bias that certain technology has introduced. Um, in early 2000, I also participated in the so-called spam wars. Uh, at that point, people thought that email is helpless and email may soon go away because it costs nothing to send junk mail and it uh, wastes everybody's time and it also degrades the trust that people put on each other's messages around the internet. But the solution to the spam um, problem was not a single top-down action, a law or an act neither was it a single technological change, neither was it at a protocol change, neither was it a single intervention by any civil society. Rather, it is all the different points that I talked about coordinating in a way that is acceptable to all the stakeholders involved, that every single action increased the cost by spammers just a little bit and reduced their expected reward just a little bit. And taken together over maybe three or four years, we delivered a coordinated action that made it um, much more manageable. And now people don't complain much about spams anymore. And I think this is one of the blueprints that I'm using uh, in order to look at the manufactured addiction problem, the inherent bias problem, um, machine learning, um, the people's distrust in general, um, for example, algorithmic uh, decided um, outcomes and things like that. All of it um, is much easier to solve if we get all the stakeholders on the same table in a continuous relationship and mapping out exactly what everybody stakes it and keeps it transparent and accountable, just as we did uh, in the Internet Society and related um, organizations during the spam war days. So I think there are a set of technologies, civic technologies, that can help uh, solving these problems. But I don't deny that there are also actors that uh, would like to maintain the mm, monopoly on precision persuasion, uh, for lack of better terms. So this is an ongoing dialogue. And also that if you are building these kinds of things, it's very important, presumably, to have real diversity in terms of who is inputting to these technologies, because otherwise they're going to reflect already, I and mean, you talk about bias, but there is presumably you would see a danger if there are too few women as, as we know there are in STEM, for example, that this, this can replicate biases then in, in terms of what is produced. Yeah, when I founded my first startup in 1996 in Taiwan, actually people majoring in computer science are working on IT and so on. The gender ratio is very healthy. It's close to one one-on-one. -on -one. So I think um, when I got online, I discovered that the free software community, the maker community and so on, many women are forced to use male sounding nicknames, not because uh, they identify as transgender, but rather <laughs> they did this to avoid avoid harassment and it's apparently a very uh important and significant issue uh, on the Western English speaking uh, world. And, and that took me completely by surprise because Taiwan is not like that. So <laughs> I, I think this is, um, highlights a, the importance of participation because in Taiwan we have different problems. For example, the indigenous people, they don't participate enough in the design of everyday technology that affects them uh, as are the other ethnicities because Taiwan is like 98% ethnic Han. So the other ethnicities' voices don't often get heard simply because of the language or the lived experience differences. And so I think one of the main uh, points in diversity is not just 
getting sufficient number of uh, people, although that helps. Like our spokesperson now is uh, a indigenous woman. Our president is also partly indigenous, and she's a woman and not anyone's daughter or wife. We think this is very important. But rather um, than just diversity, uh, I think real inclusion means that all the different people participating in the end result of the designs, such as, uh, for example, in our K-12 education, we emphasize that people use technology with to work with children. They must prefer open source technology. That is to say um, that students have a say in where the technology is doing, like the access to machine learning and computation resources. Uh, it, there must be no difference between the city and indigenous or rural areas and things like that, and also broadband as a human right. What I'm saying is that um, it is very important to have diversity in the um, community that makes things. But I think even more important is to have full inclusion uh, in a set of um, users, in a set of people who use these technologies so they can fully inform where the technology is doing and in, do, in so doing, democratize the production of technology itself. Thank you. That's a, an incredibly useful um, uh, way of looking at it. And I'm interested if you have any particular thoughts about how we as a small party operating in a system that is in many ways stacked against us might uh, use technology ourselves or think about using technology ourselves. I'll give you one example. There was um, a lot of concern here around the Cambridge Analytica controversy hmm. and what that actually showed, although this again got very little coverage, was not just about that one incident, but in fact, there are many people uh, who legitimately provide such services, you know, where they get a great deal of big data around the electorate and they analyze it and they are able to zero in on what that means. And the parties, the bigger parties that can afford to pay for that, therefore have a, an advantage when it comes to, particularly in a first-past-the-post system, in terms of targeting their voters. So one of the things we have to think about is how we can be clever and do things, do things that, that try and mitigate some of these uh, inbuilt disadvantages under which we, we are acting. Um, do you have any, any particular tips for us about what that might look like? Hmm. So um, in the Gulf Syria movement, um, which is not just about supporting sunflower occupiers, but also about making more attractive and fun, uh, open alternatives to the government websites for all the government websites that the Gulf Zero people don't um, think are useful or um, you know attractive enough. Uh, they end in GOVTW, those government websites. And so like the legislative is LYGOVTW. And so so the Gov Zero people would just make a new domain name, ly.g0vtw. Basically, by changing an O to a zero, you get into the shadow government that is more attractive and more participatory. And so one of the recent um, uh, interventions that the Gov Zero community did, which get a lot of press attention, uh, is the councillor's voting guide which includes the mayor's voting guide, because we have a local election coming up in about 90 days from now. And the councillor's voting guide is designed to maximize um, the people's informed um, information before voting, going into the voting booth. So not only does it include all the voting records and all the um, you know, uh, political career over a candidate's career, what they voted, what they advocated, and what are their um, you know, disclosures, spendings, and things like that, but also um, it innovates by if you go to your precinct or your region, it lists all the councillors in a random order and with random color. And what, what this means is that all the smaller parties, candidates, and all the independent candidates get as much the same coverage <laughs> as the large parties in the voter's guide. And they also crowdsource for newcomers, uh, their platforms in the form of a small short YouTube video, or they also allow people to sign in in their social media profiles and vote for the 
people they want, and they even have some grants for people who receive the most number of uh, people's likes and things like that. So in in uh, all these cases, they act with what we call the ACE principle. A means actionable. It means that if you support a small party's candidate, there's something that you can do with five seconds time. There's something you can do with your five minutes time. There's something you can do with five uh, hours time. That's the actionable part. And it's connected, meaning that whenever you do this, um, it raises your relative status among your peers <laughs> so that uh, people would feel proud <laughs> to uh, endorse a candidate or to ask a candidate a relevant question or to make a summary of a candidate's position and so on. That makes it um, social so that people see on their social media profiles all the time those independent candidates. For example, there's a so-called Obasan coalition. Obasan is a Japanese loan word, literally uh, means elder women. And so there is a loose coalition of elder women, uh, counselor candidates who are all running for the first time that maximize the use of social media through this use of the counselor's voting guide. And they're not just doing it on the internet, but rather it crowdsources the agenda that people care about on the internet and hold face-to-face -face deliberations based on the topics that uh, people on the internet feel as important. And that brings us to the uh, third, which is extensible. Extensible means um, like, you know, the Me Too hashtag, nobody controls that hashtag. Everybody is uh, allowed to add to it without asking permission. So this kind of permissionless innovation uh, also lies behind the GovZero philosophy because the entire um, code, the entire data set, everything is under what we call creative commons zero, which means no rights reserved. Everybody is allowed to take it to wildly different directions and to make um, mix remixes and re-remixes and so on. And so we're already seeing a lot of uh, local campaigns that use this as a canvassing tool uh, and that develops a, a much more targeted way based on the collected information on the counselor's voting guide. So, but that's pretty particular to Taiwan. I'm not sure whether how much that helps you, but this is how we're doing it. Yeah. No, well, I think that I, I think there are some wonderful ideas in there. How feasible they are, I don't know. Mm. Just because you know, different legislative environment mm. and mm -hmm. different cost base for these things. But I absolutely believe that we should be exploring all of this and and seeing seeing what we can do. Because it's not it's not as if technology is going to go away. Um, you know, so that's yeah. the other thing. It's about it's mm -hmm. about what what we see coming towards us um what what do you mm -hmm. what would you see as the as the sort of the technologies that are heading our way that might make a might make a difference as well hmm. so um <clears throat> In this, um, in the social innovation scene here in Taiwan, we're seeing a lot of uh, work around uh, mutual distributed ledgers. Um, I try to avoid the blockchain word because it is just one of the many <laughs> I, technologies I was... that can, yeah, <laughs> that can yeah, deliver was, a mutual distributed that. ledger. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So the the and, and the newer generation distributed ledgers, they're not even using chains anymore. They're using ethically graph and so on. But without getting too technical, I think what's important is that it's a ledger that people can add to but not delete, that people can uh, audit but they cannot censor. And that is the important part of it. It's not the, the ICO part of it, although I'm sure that people are interested in that as well. But for my purposes, uh, what this uh, means is, is a relatively cheap way to build accountability to build something that people can reasonably sure that will not be changed or to be uh, censored or modified. And so we're already seeing it uh, in use, for example, in campaign donations uh, and even in disaster relief donations. For example, a lot of Taiwan people donated to the uh, Nepal flooding um, disaster. And people want to know that their donation is being used in a conscious and accountable way across many different actors in many jurisdictions and pre previously to buy this kind of accountability is very expensive because you have to hire I don't know KPMG or equivalent uh, you know accountants in all the different jurisdictions to make sure that the uh, numbers add up and it's pretty um, expert language and people cannot easily verify it by themselves so they're 
uh, still doing that, but they're now also using distributed ledgers to make sure that even if the crowdsourcing or crowdfunding slides go away, they can still reconstruct the entire accountability trail from the Ethereum uh, public distributed ledger alone. And we're also seeing a lot of people um, doing public discourse uh, this way because they know they will not be censored by editors, they will not um, cave to pressure by uh, you know powerful sovereign entities. If uh, they try to censor them, this even attempt of censorship will be very apparent on the distributed ledger and uh, is often a lost cause. So it's also important um, to get uh, people's voice heard in a way that preserves integrity. So I think accountability and integrity are the two uh, not often advised, but I think uh, it is actually a primary value that distributed ledgers offer us today, uh, much more than its financial potentials. One of the things that strikes me about a lot of conversation about what distributed ledger technology, which yes, people here mostly know as blockchain, um, would, mm. uh, would create is um, that people don't always think about the different impacts for, on gender and, and the different ways this would affect us. So for example, there are some women and certainly um, people from minority populations, for example, who would be very worried by something that that was irrevocable and which identified them and held information about them irrevocably because they have spent a lot of time actually trying not to be seen or not to be defined in a particular way. Um, how, how should we approach these different um, strains, if you like, in evolving technology mm. where, where, you know, the, the, uh, you can see the beauty of something that can't be censored and can't be changed for, for in some cases, but then it may have other unintended consequences. That's right. Um, so the two use cases that I mentioned, uh, one for the um, use of public charity donations and the second uh, for people's public discourse, uh, those two, I think, are definitely in the public sphere and not at all uh, in a private or uh, friend or whatever family setting. Um, I would not advise the use of mutual distributed ledgers at this point in time for any actions that you just mentioned that uh, has a privacy part in it. I understand that there's many mathematicians working on um, privacy preserving so-called zero knowledge mathematics, but they are far from mature uh, at this point. And so um, if people are um, intending to use distributed ledgers in a way that interacts with private data, sensitive data, data with limited distribution, and things like that, there are other cryptographic tools such as end-to-end -end messaging and um, um, you know um, publicly auditable uh, forward secrecy preserving chat tools uh, like, uh, for example, personally, I use Wire, but Signal uh, also has a lot of users and things like that uh, that are much more useful than distributed ledgers for this setting. So I think one part of uh, literacy or one part of awareness is just to make sure that people understand the material of technology and the property that they, they uphold, because code in this case is like law and not like um, jurisdiction law, it's like physical law. Um, each different technology uh, imbues with, with itself a different set of physical law that makes things easy, that makes things possible, that makes things impossible. So I think one of the uh, most important thing when we did our K-12 curriculum is learning with the children how they want technology to behave and then um, make technologies or allocate technologies that respond to their expectations about the social setting and not the other way around. Um, many buzzword makers would like it to be other way around, but I think that is actually detrimental to the autonomy of people with various different ideas and different social expectations. That seems to me a very important principle for anybody who is trying to make policy around these issues to, to understand that aspect. Um, can I ask you about, I think it's called POLIS. Uh, you, we were talking That's before right. about the ways in which you were able to find consensus 
from very mm -hmm. strongly polarized viewpoints. Um, mm -hmm. Is Polis something that we as a party could be using and what would it look like if you applied mm -hmm. it to some, some very polarized debates that there are within feminism, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Polis is great if you may use it as an agenda setting tool. Um, by that, I mean that it surfaces what people's common values are, despite their differences, and it enables people to find possible solutions that follows those common values. What is not so great is to work out the details of those ideas. For that, you need other tools. Um, but the great thing about Polis and so, so, other so, technologies so that they're... I'm, just, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry? I'm just yeah. going to inter interrupt briefly to... Yes. So po Polis, I mean, for people who haven't read or heard about it it's a it's a platform mm -hmm. yes that right so so uh, I'll, I'll just explain it very quickly um so yes, polis is like a it's like a open questionnaire uh when you go to polis you're seeing one of the few what we call seed questions that ask simple yes or no questions about how you feel about one particular issue. Um, the first time we used POTUS in Taiwan government, we talked about uh, private ride sharing in the form of UberX. So for example, the first time when one goes to POTUS, one can see a yes or no question like, I think um, private passengers still need to have protection from accidents by commercial insurance providers. Uh, and you can click yes or no on that particular sentiment. And as you do so, um, there is a face of the crowd uh, underneath this yes or no question that shows the clusters, the people who think similarly about things. And you can see all your Facebook and Twitter friends if you sign in. If you don't sign in, you see random famous people uh, and how they uh, locate within the different clusters. So Perhaps there's people who care about innovation. There's people who cares about safety. There's people who care about insurance. There's people who text about taxation and so on. Then they will form different clusters. And as you answer yes or no questions, your avatar will move toward the cluster that most resemble your ideas. But the beauty of Polis, um, there are two um, distinguishing factors. First, there is no reply button. You can just press yes or no, like upvote and downvote on other people's sentiments, but you can never reply to them. So trolling, ad hominem attacks, and so on has no place on Polis. If you can get 5,000 people voting exactly the same way, there's still one dot in the two-dimensional map. So it doesn't pay to troll in a Polis environment. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that after you answer a few yes or no questions, you can contribute your own feelings. And the more resonance you have for your own feelings, the higher the score is. So it still engage people in competitive way. The people compete to win resonance on um, people across the aisle. So, so, and so to win that, 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 yes. that, that competing to win people over to their viewpoint. So it's almost That's right. So basically, like a game. Yeah. Like a game. Yeah, it, it is actually a game. So um, just to make it uh, more visual, uh, here is how it looks like. Uh, I hope you can see the screen. Um, and so on the yes. top, you can see one yes or no question. And on the below, you have an avatar moving as you answer. And you can see the cluster of people. And after a few weeks, we always see something like this where people identify the divisive um, things that they uh, agree to disagree, but people spend far more time on consensus statements that they want to win uh, over um, people from other aisles and other clusters. And so whenever we see a shape like this, which is always actually, um, we always know that people want to spend much more time to work out the details of what they feel as important as everybody. And it also lets people know that although there are a few like five divisive questions that tells people apart, um, no matter which groups you are, there are like 99% of people, 98% of people who share the common values after all. But on normal social media, people spend, it's like flip around, people spend most of their time arguing their differences while spending very little time arguing about their consensus. So, um, 
is that is that platform something that that anyone can use Oh yeah, it is entirely open source, and uh, we have a instance running here in the Taiwan national government. Um, but you don't have to be a Taiwanese citizen; you can still use our instance. But you can; it's easy to set up your own if you know a technological people who can set up um, a, a machine. Yeah. As we've been speaking, I've been imagining the very few people that we actually have in our. our in our team with their heads in their hands because I they know I'm going to come away from this conversation going, we should do Polish, we should do Polish. Mm -hmm. That should be, um, as you say, the, the um, websites that look like government websites but are actually have the information in them that the government websites don't, you know. But that, mm -hmm. all of those things do sound like a lot of work. So my question to you is mm -hmm. how, how is this actually done practically who mm -hmm. is doing the work here yes so um we actually start normally with a easier version which is not police uh and it's called slido actually uh, slido is something that i use for all my public lectures uh and so i just came up uh from a um, conference called um uh, Tai Chi, which is a Taiwan uh, computer human interface uh, conference. And the Slido idea is similar to Polis. Um, you go to slido.com, you enter a number or a code, and you get to start asking questions. Um, unlike Polis, there is no clustering, there's no moving around, but you can still like um, each other's questions and you can make things that people like the most flow to the top. And similarly, there is no reply button. And similarly, the only way to get something floating to the top is not attacking the current top uh, question or top idea, but actually proposing something that resonates with more people. So Slido is best used in a town hall setting uh, with 200 or 2,000 people in the same room uh, synchronously, um, while Polis is best used over uh, weeks, several weeks time, so that people have more time to come up with nuanced statements. So um, we often mix the two. For example, we will have a kickoff meeting uh, where the people in the civil service, people who care about this, the activists, the various stakeholder groups and so on, we first do a kickoff meeting where we talk about how to define the topic of this um, conversation. For example, just the name, uh, private ride sharing while charging people for it took us like three meetings uh, to arrive to this definition. Uh, for example, we had another important conversation on Polis where we again took two or three pre-meetings um, uh, where we talk about non-consensual distribution of intimate images. Uh, so like every word was hotly debated because people want each stakeholder group to feel as comfortable as possible with the definition of the name. And so for this kind of meeting, we don't use polis. We use regular teleconference or face-to-face -face discussion uh, with deliberation facilitators and with Slido so that people can feel comfortable raising their points in those face-to-face -face meetings without um, you know, the people who hoard the microphone taking all the time uh, about it. Uh, but then after a few such meetings where we then converge on the uh, well-defined topic of what we can talk about, then each stakeholder goes back to their group and we give them the same URL, the same web address for Polis in the same time so that people can share at the same minute. And it's important because if people come to Polis and they see like they're alone in one corner, while 90% of people was dominated uh, by some other faction, uh, they will be turned off and they will not share the Polis conversation. And so it's important that a balanced um, number of stakeholders get the police conversation at the same time. And we bind ourselves saying after, I don't know, a month or so, any popular opinion, any resonating feeling that surfaces in the police that's convinced a super majority of people, meaning that in all the different clusters, it convinced the majority, the more resonating it is, the easier for us to use this as an agenda for our next multi-stakeholder meeting, which is usually live streamed and which the facilitator just checks the consensus from the people one by one with the stakeholders saying the people have spoken. So 
What do you feel about it? Is this feasible? Is this possible? If it is, what actions are we committing to deliver on those shared values? And so this is a three-part thing. The first one is a stakeholder building trust, deciding on exactly what topic to talk about. The longer asynchronous uh, policy stage, which usually lasts for three or four weeks until we get a set of consensus. And then the same stakeholders or even more stakeholders because people uh, become aware of it after the fact, uh, go back to the same room, live stream, or at least take a recording or a transcript and everybody responds just to the points from the poll is that gets everybody's consensus. And then we find ourselves into coordinated action. So this is how often it's done in the V Taiwan method. And then and then at the end of all of that, you might have a vote on something in, in the way that you would you would expect in a democracy, presumably. So you you go through this process of, of deliberation and and moving people using both direct well, methods. Surprisingly, um, only about 20% of v cases led into a law change, uh, in which case, of course, the parliament need to do uh, their conversation and they need to vote on it, but they mostly know that it's already the people's consensus. So other than one case, the other cases, um, the MPs just you know, accepted the, the consensus on police. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the other 80%, which is regulatory change, policy change, or even behavior change, it doesn't need a full conversation by the parliament. So just people committing to the actions, deliver and uh, work through those actions, and they hold themselves accountable to it. And that's it. And so for many things like, for example, cyberbullying, um, what we did was not making a new law but rather making sure that each ministry and each department uh, deliver their responsibility in doing um, their part of work against cyberbullying. And so it doesn't always lead to a vote, maybe just one in five cases lead to a vote. You said you were using it on a consultation around the sharing of image of uh, the non-consensual sharing images. of images. That's intimate right. Images. So of what, intimate what images. Might, yes. might refer to as, as revenge porn, for example. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that was the initial name, actually. <laughs> uh, but then uh, ah. people um, pointed out that it's often not porn, and uh, calling it porn actually um, obscures the original image collection, which was to show intimacy and not at all for arousal, uh, or not always for arousal. It is mostly to, to show intimacy. So people eventually changed the name to, to NCII. Um, I'm neutral on this matter, as I must, uh, but <laughs> this is just how it happened in Taiwan. So I, I think in NCII, it's very interesting also because um, people started talking uh, on it as a primarily affecting women um, thing, but then we discovered that there's also um, NCII cases uh, around LGBT uh, groups. Um, there's also uh, NCII um, things in basically anywhere that has a an unequal, uh, potentially oppressive power structure. Uh, NCII is used as one of the power vehicles. And so while women are, of course, uh, one of those groups, they're not the only group. And uh, this is the idea of intersectionality, right? People are vulnerable on various different parts uh, and, and any um, humiliation or any uh, power struggle in any of those intersectional parts um, can reinforce each other's um, power when we want to talk about this, saying this is wrong and we don't have to resort to calling it um, you know, pornography or calling it um, indecent image or things like that because people need to have control of their own intimate images, uh, no matter which gender or which social status they are. And so I think this is a more inclusive way of having a dialogue because stakeholders just um, discover this conversation and then uh, we learn about new stories that we did not anticipate that they are also victims of NCII. That's completely fascinating. Um, I am very aware that I'm talking to you for much longer than I intended to, but um, no, it's fine. It's there, just there, fine. There, yeah. are, there are so many things here that, that I want to know about. Um, I mentioned before your um, 
your that you actually mm -hmm. grew up in in silicon or you you came to silicon valley ridiculously young didn't you um is, well did i read 19 is 19 is not ridiculously young uh i i stayed in germany for a year when i was 11 uh and then one year in the valley when i was 18 or 19. um so so now <laughs> i'm mostly based in taiwan actually Oh, I thought you'd, uh, so I may be misinformed here. I thought you had founded a startup mm. very young. I did, I did, uh, when I was 15, actually. That was my first startup. Ah. And then oh, a see. series but, of startups. But, but not... was, yeah. Well, it, it got invested eventually by Intel and, and was one of the dot-com stories um, in Taiwan, but at, at that time, um, I think it, everything is very international <laughs> and then we, we don't call ourselves a Silicon Valley company. We're still at that time mostly based in, in Asia. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's my first startup when I was 15. Or, yeah. Uh, I, that, that, I mean, I've been wondering, um, I'm very glad that you're in Taiwan and doing what you're doing, but mm -hmm. you know, there was part mm -hmm. of me that was wishing that you we're in America, maybe doing finding ways to um, revitalize the democracy there right now. <laughs> yeah, we we hold actually um, uh, workshops in New York City, and many people in the NYC, and actually also people from 18F from the federal uh, government, and we also talk about people from the U.S. Digital Service and and the usual suspects. And, and I think um, there's still a lot of people doing useful work around civic participation, open government, especially on a state and city level. Because to think about it, Taiwan is actually just a larger city. The northmost city, Taipei, and the south uh, in Kaohsiung, uh, taking high-speed rails is just an hour and a half. So while we're 23 million people, admittedly, is on a relatively small um, geographic island, uh, which is why we can see Robin as a human right and so on. But it also means that the technologies we develop um, are mostly scaled uh, to this geographic scale and to maybe uh, 5 million people, give or take, and which in the United States is you know, just maybe have a New York state or something like that. So I think it, it makes uh, sense to start our experiments and start our uh, coordination and workshops and so on on this um, self-ruling to a degree um, uh, cities or states uh, in this kind of size. Sorry, I just lost the sound for a second there. Ah, okay. Well, I am recording my side of the Sorry, sound, so just, we can always st stitch everything together. Yes. No, no, that, that's good. I just, just at the end, you froze for a second. Um, I'll, I'll finish with a, a question that we're going to go on and debate at this Women's Equality Party conference. And that's really whether um, data-driven technology can actually help to resolve inequality. Do you have views on hmm. that issue? Yes, uh, strong views also. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, good. right, I, I, I think data agency, data as a relationship and not as an asset um, is something that even with the GDPR, um, many policymakers still have not um, internalized uh, this view on data. Um, and and I, I'm not just quoting GDPR because uh, in Taiwan, the Privacy Protection Act, the PIPA says the same thing. It basically says, if a organization or institution holds my data, it begins a relationship where I can always ask what's happening with this data. I can update it if they want it uh, to be used in a way that goes beyond the original collection purposes. I need to be given a chance to be informed and even update about it because the alternative is just to have a pale shadow of a um, data-driven um, simulacrum of me four years ago, a small, uh, you know, part of my behavior that would be extrapolated often wrongly 
about my current status. And uh, if we see data as an asset and not a relationship, uh, we will end up with the data that are there, but uh, are basically reinforcing biases, not just from our past selves, but also from past social conditions. And this is very important to see that only a living relationship between the data so-called producers and so-called data processors and so-called data um, users or consumers, um, they need to trust each other through a accountability framework that enables constant interrogation, constant relationship between all those different people involved. And only at that time can we get the agency uh, of the people back to the people so-called producing. Um, the data for collection. And um, I think if the people producing data or people collecting data are generally aware of this, then they see them their contributions as in the commons. For example, in Taiwan, we're now working with the Mozilla Foundation on a project called Common Voice, uh, which is basically us uh, reading aloud random fragments of um, public domain text and basically informing the machine learning algorithm so they can recognize the different accent, the different ways people use language, even ethnic minorities, indigenous people, and things like that, instead of forcing everybody to speak in a accent that most resembles uh, whatever the <laughs> original voice actors that the machine learning companies contracted with. And so this commons uh, that uh, resembles the way people actually speak are entirely done by voluntary contributions and with the people knowing that they can also use the voice data in this commons for whatever purpose they like and they can also update it and reflect what they um, want things to, to go through. Again, democratization of this technology. And if this is in the commons, if this is managed by a social enterprise or a cooperative that everybody can openly join, then this is seen as something that shares everybody's stewardship responsibilities, but also rights. But if on the other hand, the collection itself is opaque, if on the other hand, the collection itself makes biased uh, assumptions that people are not aware of, not even the data scientists themselves are aware of, then we get a situation where like we get a lot of food, we feed it into machine learning algorithm, but there's no nutrition labels. <laughs> we don't know that whether the AIs get over those on one thing or another and then the data agency uh, will be much harder to be built as a kind of ad hoc or post facto way because the mathematics is just not there yet so it need to be uh, privacy enhancing by design and if people choose to contribute to the commons this is by their voluntary action and again the stewardship need to be designed um, in the beginning not uh, as a tacked on um, kind of law or regulation because that doesn't work frankly speaking thank you that's uh, such an excellent answer um, great way mm. to set the scene for the debate and incredibly useful uh, insights into what we might be doing. So thank you again so much for mm. speaking to me. Well, thank you. So I'll send you my end of voice recordings and you send me the video recordings on your end. So we'll have a yes. very high quality stitched version. Okay. So <laughs> that, thank you so that's much. That's right. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.